Welcome back to CIS 125. Once again, I'm your instructor, Victor Campos. <clears throat> as a reminder, the class is being recorded for playback. As such, the material will be uploaded to the class later today. So uh, I'll do a quick overview of the module stuff. This has been available um, since morning and we'll look at it together briefly and then we'll get started with the material. So we're on week 12, week 12 of the semester. And we've got more techniques for animation. We've seen the automated animation from two weeks ago. We saw the handmade frame by frame animation last week. And this week, we're going to see kind of a little bit of combination of both, some, um, some automated stuff plus frame by frame stuff. In this case, um, special effects with symbols, and then I'll cover symbols, which are very important moving forward. We'll also look at the importance of scenes to divide up your project into sort of like sections. And we'll also look at the camera features that Animate has. Not only can you animate the things on the stage or your project, but you can also animate the camera itself, like moving around in the world and such. So we'll look at all of that this week. And some of it will be handcrafted frame by frame, and some of it will be automated but it'll all basically tie into the importance of symbols and scenes. There's no homework this week, so you can catch up on any previous homework. Now there is the one due tomorrow that I gave you last week about the uh, frame by frame. And obviously the deadline is tomorrow, but from my point of view here, this shows me uh, there's been four submissions on that so far. So, uh, four of you finished it before the deadline, and then the rest of you haven't yet. And that's okay. The deadline is tomorrow. But I'm just noting here that um, maybe you're all working on it very, very hard, and that's why there aren't a lot of submissions yet, and that's fine. Now, the there's, no, there's not going to be any homework this week, um, and obviously there's the deadline of tomorrow. Uh, but if there's any late work you haven't done, you can still do it because of the open time this week. Check the syllabus for the plan of future weeks. But this week we've got more animation to learn and then the homework due tomorrow from last week. So back to the overview here, we've got new concepts. This is all from the resources and we'll use these in the lecture in a moment. Um, special effects and such. So symbols, a very important concept that we will learn today. They work great with animation and they're even more important when you get into the parts about interactivity. Remember, Adobe Animate can let you make animations, but also video games. Now the video games will be the focus of CIS 126, which is in the summer. I'm not sure if open enrollment is here yet, but enrollment is coming soon. And of course you wanna enroll in uh, CIS 126, and it'll be the same thing Mondays in this room at 12 or 1220 or whatever they said it. Um, and actually, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be Mondays and Wednesdays. Now, as we've seen in this class, I, I allow the flexibility of you can be here in person in the lab, or you can be online, at home, on Zoom, or watch the recording. So if the class will be scheduled on Monday and Wednesday, and Wednesday is difficult for you to be here, again, that's okay. It's not going to affect your attendance. Doing the work is going to affect your attendance and your grade. So over the summer, I expect CIS 126 to be Mondays and Wednesdays, 12 to 3 or whatever it is. And as usual, I'll be recording it. I'll be broadcasting it live. And on 126, there'll be more of the focus, or actually all of the focus, most of the focus will be on the video game side of Animate. How can you make video games with Adobe Animate? Symbols will be one of the important things for that, as well as scenes. So we're gonna start to touch on it a little bit 
in part one. But the gaming will be focused on 126 as well as other techniques of advanced animation. That's for the future. This week, more techniques for animation. I have here the previous week's stuff, the frame by frame stuff from last week and the automated stuff from two weeks ago. So I'm kind of building it up um, as we go on these weeks. As I said, this week, there's no homework, but I would do any late homework or anything that you're missing. Or if you did an assignment that wasn't the perfect assignment that you thought it was going to be, you can redo it. You can resubmit it. You have to send me an, a message on the inbox because sometimes Canvas doesn't alert me that you've resubmitted a work. It, it alerts me when you submit it on time, definitely. But if it's late, it might not alert me. So if you send me a message on the inbox saying, uh, hey, instructor, I submitted week five again for a reach for a regrade. Can you can you check it? That'll be better because then I'll be able to um, I'll be able to actually go in and, and grade it compared to if the system doesn't alert me. So contact me there. Next week, we're going to start to look at sound. So how to add sound to your project so that it actually feels much more uh, like a starting to feel like a much more full featured project. So we will see sound coming next week. And then as you see the syllabus, the end of the semester is also coming soon and how it will all tie together. I've got an extra video here that you can check out. Devin Kong has a variety of videos on Adobe Animate that I really like. I've specifically linked to one of them related to symbols, but I would recommend you browse that and look at all of them. I think he's got like 20 of them and they're short. And he talks about different aspects of Animate. So more knowledge is always more good. All right, so for this particular week, we're gonna look at symbols, scenes, and the camera, and how special effects tie into symbols. Go ahead and go into Adobe Animate. Create a, a project as usual, HD, 24 frames, and um, save the file, and then we'll start to learn some new stuff. So, the uh, the usual, create a new project file here, full HD, 24 FPS, cinematic quality animation. I like to change my background color, so anything besides plain white. I also want to change my zoom, fit in window, and then I'll save this. On the desktop, I'll create a project folder, week 12. We work on separate files this time this week, I guess. Uh, so maybe this one we'll call it symbols practice or whatever you want to call it. We've got a starting point here. Okay, so symbols. Um, symbols are really cool because they allow you to create sort of like sprites. If you know a little bit about gaming, they allow you to create these assets, these pieces of a project, either in animation or a game. What these symbols do, they're sort of like their own little self-contained movie. So here's an example that we will do together. Let's say I'm setting up a scene at a dark, scary castle, and I want torches burning. I want torches lit and burning. Well, those torches might best be created as a symbol. So I draw one instance of the torch, draw it and animate it. And then I just make copies of that one torch. I put four torches on the screen. I only needed to draw one. I needed to only animate one. But then out of that one um, symbol, then I set up various instances and I've cut so much work off my, uh, cut off so much time off of my work. Instead of animating four different 
torches, I create one and just reuse it. So it's sort of like a super copy and paste. But the great thing about it is this one asset is self-contained and complete. And you can, of course, change it and manipulate it. But this one starting point symbol can be used for multiple, uh, for a lot more effort. So we're going to set up like a simple scene of the front door of a castle. And then we're going to create some torches. So in my, in my uh, layers here, I'll call this uh, maybe just background BG. Then a uh, brush tool to start to draw. Um, let's see. I also want to put in, in, in mind anything that's going to be animated should be on its own layer. So let's say the castle walls itself are not going to be animated. That can be on its own layer. The torches are going to be animated. They will be on their own layer. The knight riding up to the castle will be on its own layer. So think about that. Anything that is going to be animated, anything that's going to change should be on its own layer. So let's see, how do we want to do this? A floor, the walls of a castle, I don't know, the parapets over here, some cool tower things, windows over here, I guess, a couple over here. Front door gate, I guess, a path coming to the castle. So just some um, castle, get fancy and make it 3D. So just draw some sort of castle. on its own layer. Not too complex, but just some sort of a castle on its own layer. I'm gonna lock that layer. You should always lock a layer that you're not going to make any changes to so that you don't accidentally draw on the wrong layer. It's very easy to make a mistake that really adds up when you don't draw on the layer that you're expecting. If every animation should be on its own layer, and then you put an animation on the wrong layer, that's gonna cause you problems in the future. One way to avoid those problems, lock your layers. So, new layer, I'm going to um, call this one torches. And draw one torch. Case, let's see, torch. Something like, I guess, the burnable part. It's attached to the wall, this top part over here, a little flame. That. I'm just going to draw one. Because remember, the power of symbols is that you can create one copy of a thing. And it'll be its own complete thing with its own animation, with its own effects, with its own sound. When we cover sound later, the sound of crackling fire, for example, it's going to be its own thing, its own asset, its own sprite in a way. And then I can put 10 copies of the torch. Later, I'll put a copy right here by the side of the entrance and then maybe one on top over here and then one over here. Well, I don't need to draw four different ones. If I make one nice, I can then make multiples of them. So on its own layer, the castle, on its own layer, one torch. I'm going to convert the, uh, I'm going to convert the um, torch into a symbol. 
So you're going to select it. This is another reason to put it on its own layers. I'm going to try, I'm going to make a selection. I want to grab onto the torch. And if I try to make a selection and I don't have the layers locked, I'm accidentally, accidentally going to grab other parts of the design like this. Whoops. I also selected that part of the window. This is why you want things on their own layer. Because even if I make a selection like this, it's only going to grab the torch. It's on its own layer. The background is, is on its own layer and locked. So I only selected the torch. There's a keyboard shortcut for this, of course. But for the moment, a right click. So again, wherever you click matters, wherever you right click matters. I selected the torch, but if I right click on the sky, I didn't, I'm not selecting what I want to work with. And I drew the torch. I didn't fill in the colors and all of that. I'll do that later. But if I select the torch and I right click right here in the middle of the torch, no, there's nothing there. I didn't fill in the color. If I right click here, it's like selecting the background. So I have to right click on the torch where I drew it. The icon is slightly different. You see that you see the move icon when I'm actually on the object. If I'm right here, there's a different icon. I, I, nothing is selected. So I drew the torch. I'm going to select the torch, right click it. Then we have here, convert to symbol, F8. You're going to want to memorize that shortcut. F5, F6, F7, F8, you're going to use over and over. Five, F5, add a frame, add more time. F6, copy the keyframe to make a change. F7, blank keyframe. F8, convert to symbol. So that's what I'm doing here, convert to symbol. It'll pop up to ask, what do you want to call this object, this symbol? You can have as many objects as you want. Doesn't matter. They could be named anything you want, although there's some uh, suggestions. We can call this torch, sure. But I would recommend, especially when we get to the part about programming a game, it's often a good idea to name these things a certain way. Um, this particular thing that we're going to work with is a graphic. Later on, we're going to work with sound. Later on, we're going to work with animation and such. So GFX, Torch, might be a better name because this is a graphic. Later on, we'll deal with sound, SND, sound. Let's say sound. Um, you know, background, or let's say a happy music. So later on, we have some happy music and we prefix it with sound. Later on, when we work with um, movie clips, MC, cat. So these names don't matter, but they do in a way for you to keep track of them. What they are is a graphic, GFX, torch, don't put a space, that'll cause problems. Put an underscore if you want. Um, you can put a capital letters, GFX for graphics. And then it says type, movie clip button graphic. Like if we were going to work with buttons later on for our game, BTN start. This is the start button so I can start the game. In this case, GFX graphics, torch, and set your type to graphic. So we give it the name graphics torch. It's of type graphic. And this registration here will, will matter more later. But for the moment, I'm going to set it here in the center. This will be more important later, but this is for, let's say we want something to rotate. If we want to spin around or to lean over or whatever, the registration point is from where it will change. If I have it on the default top left, when this rotates, it'll rotate from the top left corner. 
oftentimes things want to rotate from the center. So imagine that this is the drawing of the torch. And if we set the registration on the top left, it'll rotate from the top left. If I wanted this to rotate, like it's gonna, uh, you need to move the torch to unlock the secret passageway. Well, it's gonna rotate from the center. Maybe in this case, I want it to rotate from the bottom because okay, it's attached to the wall. The, ro the, the torch rotates from, from the base. So it's gonna rotate from there. Uh, center is your safest, safest setting usually. We give it a name, we give it a type, we give it a rotation point, registration point. This advanced stuff, don't worry about it at the moment in this folder, don't worry about that. Just click OK. What happens on screen now is that this is now a symbol, whereas everything else is not. So if you bring your mouse close to the edge of your drawing and you can you know, manipulate it as normal, but on this one, this is one thing now, one object. You're not manipulating an individual line. It's a one object. It's one specific thing. To make sure that that is turned into a symbol. On the properties, this object is a graphic, which you can change if you want. Something about an instance name, don't worry about that. Other important things over here that we'll get to today. But here it tells you exactly, here's the exact coordinates of where this thing is at. If I want to exactly put this in my case here, with exact coordinates, this object, has properties, position, and size. This object is exactly 85 pixels wide by 200. And see, actually, I want that to be 200 wide. So it's going to be big. We have these things that we have access to now that it's been sim symbolized, symbolified. I can lock this as, I can turn on the little lock right here. So if I change the width, it also changes the height in correct proportion. If I don't have that lock on, it may change the sizes of things out of proportion. Look at other things here at later. But we've got this symbol, object. All your symbols exist in the library. We've previously dealt with the library a little bit um, when we imported graphics. Remember a while ago when we were tracing things, we imported a picture of Mario and we were gonna trace it. Well, that was found, that was stored in your library. Switch over to the library panel and you see that this graphic this item, this object of this project is here in the library. The icon shows it's a graphic. There's the name of it. Double click to change the name if you want to. Also see down at the bottom, a few icons. I can create a symbol. I can create a symbol directly in the library. So I can create an empty symbol, then draw into it. Or oftentimes you're gonna draw something and then turn it into the symbol like I just showed you, right click, convert to symbol. When you've got lots of symbols, there might be a lot of stuff to keep track of and organize. You can create folders within your library, put all of the symbols related to this character in a folder, put all of the pieces of this part of your movie in this folder. You can organize yourself in folders if you want, similar like in Photoshop, similar to the folders here in layers, just for organization. Tell me the info or the properties 
of this particular symbol. That takes you back to when you created it. Or if you don't want this symbol anymore, you can delete it, which of course you can undo. You see that if, if I deleted it from the library, it deleted all copies off of the stage, off of my scene here. Of course, if I've got a symbol on the stage, it is connected to its original object in the library. And if I delete it in the library, it deletes in my movie. So if I've got the object in the library, I can just drag a new copy onto the stage. It. I seen. Again, it's like a super copy and paste. Well, I kind of like that the size of these two here is that size, but I kind of want a smaller size for the two at the top. Okay. That instance of the object, I can go back to the properties and change only the properties of that instance or with the free transform tool. So they can all start off with the same sort of size and dimensions and the like, but then each one can be individually edited. And because now we know here that we can have exact values. Let's see what's a good size. Let's say 50. Say 150. So then I know that I want the one on the left on the tower to match the one on the right on the tower. So instead of me trying to guess the exact dimensions, okay, I know that that one is 150. So if I make that one over there, 150. Exactly. Oh, that's funny. They're off by a fraction for some reason. All right, well, they're the same. So both of those now are a little bit smaller. I've set their properties exactly as I wanted. If I need them to be at the exact same height, okay, I know that the one on the right is exactly on the Y coordinate up and down 450. But the one on the left, I want that one <clears throat> to also be 450. But I didn't draw the left side quite right, so the torch is too close to the window, but you get the idea. The point is here's how you can have exact and exact design in your project based on symbols. We can put their width and height exactly perfectly. We can set their X and Y coordinates exactly perfectly if we want it. If I play my movie on the top over here, test my movie, there's no animation yet, of course, but I'm just showing here. Here's my amazing scene so far. We have the... Um, have the... castle on its own layer, and we have got the torches on their own layers. We've got multiple instances of the original symbol. Does that make sense so far? Any questions, comments at this point, either here in class or on the chat? All right, so here's the good part. I'm gonna set up an animation. I'm gonna make the torch animated. And if I make one copy of the torch animated, they will all animate. And we can have, of course, nuance on each one or specificity on each one. There's a couple of ways to do this. We're going to edit the symbol. There's a couple of ways to do this. Um, one is better than the other, depending on what you want to do. Let me show you both. One is if I double click it in the library, I double click the symbol in the library either by double clicking by double clicking the icon over here if you double click the name it thinks you want to rename it if you double click the icon you can edit it if you double click the preview up here you can edit it and what happens is 
very subtle but very important. At the top here, it says you're currently in the world, in the timeline, in the symbol of your torch. If I press back, I go back to my main scene one. I go back to my main timeline. Very important to keep track of. Not only do we need to keep track of what layer we're on, what frame we're on, now we need to keep track of what timeline we're on. If I double click the symbol in the library, now I'm in the timeline of the symbol. And you see it's got its own world of layers and frames, et cetera. To return back to my main timeline, press back. Another way to edit the symbol is instead you can double click it from the um, from your from your timeline. If you double click, if you double click one copy of it, double click, you see how everything else fades out. You're still in the world, the timeline of the symbol. You can press back to get out of the symbol timeline, the symbol world. You can also get. You can go back by also pressing here. It kind of shows you you've got the big world of the scene one. And then inside, you've got the mini world of the of the symbol. Either way, you can back out of it. So there's two ways to edit. One way would be very useful here. I just want to focus on the drawing all by itself. I don't want anything to distract me. Or I need to see compared to the rest. I need to see what I'm doing. If I double click it here, I need to see the rest of the project when I'm editing this one symbol. So both are a way to edit. One is better than the other, depending what you're trying to do. For the moment, I'm gonna say, let's double click it from the timeline. So to only focus on the torch itself and nothing else. Now we have a whole complete timeline of this one graphic. I want to then do a little bit of frame by frame animation to make this torch glow. So as I said before earlier today, anything that's going to change or animate should be on its own layer. We've drawn here a torch. But what is a torch made of? In my case, the base and the flame. The flame is going to animate, not the base. You could have the base animate, of course, but in my case, I'm going to have the, the base be stationary and the flame is what's going to move. Okay, so now, again, we want things that will change and animate on their own layer, things that will not on their own layer. So I got to divide this up a little bit. I did this on purpose because now you're going to have to really think two steps ahead. I eventually want to do X, Y, Z in a project, so I need to think about how I'm going to divide it into layers. When I first asked you to draw the torch, you know, you weren't really quite thinking about that yet, but now you are. So here's where you're going to oftentimes do the sort of fix things. So I'm going to make a layer. I'm going to name my layer base. Make a new layer called flame. Obviously, at the moment, your base layer includes both your flame and base. So I need to make some changes here. And here is a way that we can do it 20 different ways. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to erase the flame in the base layer and then redraw it on the flame layer. Or you can select and cut the flame lines cut them out of the base layer and paste them into the flame layer. Both ways will get the end, same end result. We'll do one and then other ways other times. So on my base layer, I'm going to go in here and erase the, the flame. So the... Uh, The base only has the base. Lock that layer. On the flame layer, I'm going to draw the flame. I'm 
much more to consider. I drew the flame on its own layer. And if now I want to start to color, now I want to start to color things. Say I want to put a, you know, a wooden color over here, or whatever. Um, a little bit of gold right here. Cool. And I'm going to fill in the flame with red color. Um, not doing it. Remember the problem we've always had about filling in colors is all the lines need to touch. Well, it's touching and I'm filling it in. What's wrong? What's wrong is that it's not complete. The flame layer was based on me assuming everything's touching, but we put the flame on its own layer. We have the base on its own layer. And on the base, I drew it properly and connected all the lines. But on the flame, I didn't because I, I thought, because I was looking at both and it looks like it's connected. And clearly now, if I hide the base, okay, the flame's not connected. Okay, well, I'll finish drawing the flame on its own layer. There it is. And I can fill in the color. Point of this is, this Adobe Animate is amazing, but it's very complicated because there's so many details you need to keep track of. What layer am I on? What frame am I on? What scene am I on? We haven't learned scenes yet, but what scene am I on? What timeline am I on? Am I inside of a symbol or am I on the main timeline? And now dealing with when you work with animation, everything on its own layer, do the, uh, do the, are the things on their own layer independent things? So now that I've drawn the flame properly and colored it, it's like that. Oops, that's kind of, in my case, that's kind of covering that cool little gold part that I, that I drew. Can I make it transparent? Yes, we'll cover transparency later. But the point of this is, this may or may not be a mistake. The flame is going to flicker. But here is when maybe the order of things have flame on top, base on bottom. Uh, well, if I put base on top, okay, that's kind of more my vision, that the flame is inside coming from the base. If I have flame on top, maybe the effect is nice that the flames are spilling over the side of the base. Maybe, maybe I want that. But if that's not my vision, well, I just need to change the order of these layers. In my case, I want that gold part visible. Then I want the flame to come from the base. So I have to reorder my layers, all of these subtle things. Of people working on, an, working on an animation, all of these little mistakes can be dealt with. But when you are your own animation studio, you've got to deal with all of these things and think about them and then realize it 10 steps later and then go back and fix it. Or I can't go back 10, I can't undo 10 steps. I've got to fix it moving forward. It's part of the process. So I've kind of drawn up my flame a little bit better. And then I'm going to press back. Let's go back to the main timeline. All copies of the flame have updated. So your mind should be starting to to really start to think now, oh, I, I need to make, you know, I want to make an animation with an army coming at the coming at the at the tower. Well, I'm going to draw one or two different types of soldiers, and then I'm going to have all of these copies of the soldier uh, in a squadron or a legion and such. And they're they're all going to be very similar, but maybe I draw you know two or three different soldiers and I group them all together and I got fifty soldiers. Or I need, you know, 10 copies of the same thing. I draw one symbol, make several copies, got lots of copies. This is the power of this software. Ability to create these symbols, these objects, and reuse them and tweak them. They can be independent elements, as we will see, or they can all be unified elements. Here's my project so far. 
so say we'll get up to this point. We're about to get to the first break. Actually, it's a little bit early. Um, but let's say up to this point, we're going to take a break. But at this point, make sure you set yourself up to this point. And then after the break, we'll learn the next part of this. But up to this point, make sure you've got a background of a castle or whatever. Make sure on its own layer, you've got a torch. And most importantly, make sure you turned your torch into a symbol. And then um, during the break here, you may want to color the other parts of your design if you want. We'll go on. So we'll round it up to say it's 12.50. We'll take a break until 1. And then we'll see about, well, now what's the next step? Animation. And once you animate one flame, they will all animate. So we'll be back at one o'clock. So you can take your break or you can take a moment to finish the drawing, like coloring it maybe.
All right, everyone, let's go on. So at this point, here's where the magic of symbols comes in because a symbol has its own timeline, its own little world. So we're gonna go back to edit our symbol, double click it on the library. We get back into the symbol itself and it's got its own layers and everything. So we wanna do some animation here. Um, let's say maybe 10 frames or so. So we've got two layers the base and the flame. The base is not going to change. The flame is going to change. If we don't want something to change, that's F5, or insert a regular frame. And what we want to do is on frame 10 of your base layer, go to frame 10, and this is the fast way to add frames, right? I could, I could press F5 nine times, but it's just faster to go to your ending frame and then press F5, it'll fill them in for you. The base is not gonna change. I want it to be visible for 10 frames. I'm gonna lock that layer. Now, one thing that's useful is when you lock a layer, well, it's not gonna let you edit it and it'll ask you, do you wanna unlock it? You can of course click yes, but you probably mean no, because I locked it for a reason. But what, one thing that's cool even if a layer is locked, you can still add frames. You can still remove frames. You can still create blank keyframes. So it's not gonna completely lock out any edits. And that's good because usually you want to leave alone the drawing, but maybe you wanna change its frames. So base, is, base has been extended to 10 frames and locked. Now I'm gonna animate the, uh, the flame. We're going to do the same thing, two frames at a time. We're going to animate in twos. So one keyframe and one regular frame, and then one keyframe and one regular frame. And we're going to animate this. Um, we're going to animate this frame by frame. So I'm going to jump over from on your flame layer to frame three, F7, or that's the same as blank keyframe. Blank keyframe F7, same thing. And I'm going to draw the flame moving a little. Once again, you might find it useful to turn on the onion skin to see what the previous flame looked like. And so on this new keyframe, this is your second keyframe on frame three. I'm going to draw the flame flickering, and we're just going to do that two frames, two frames, two frames, draw it until you get to frame 10 or so. So frame, frame uh, next keyframe, I'm going to Draw the flame. Let's see, so. I'm just trying to grab the original color. You can use the eyedropper to grab your original color. And then on the new frame, going to animate some sort of a change. Maybe in the beginning here, I'm going to just worry about the outline and then I'll go back and fill in the color. Skip two more frames. F7, draw the flame some other way. Now, again, I, I'm making the mistake, though, that I'm forgetting to connect the bottom of it because there's the base. I'm seeing the layer of the base, and I think the flame is completely connected, but it's not because, remember, base is on its own layer. If you hide it, oops, I forgot to draw the bottom. So however you want to do this, maybe with the other layer hidden, maybe just focus on the... Uh, flame layer. Just 
jump two more frames, F7 with my um, my my blank keyframe and my um, onion skinning on, I can see what the previous flame looked like. This final one, I guess I'll just extend it like that. So in total, it's one, two, three, four, five keyframes. Each keyframe is visible for two frames. So it was animated in twos. That's that technique. You can animate in threes where you have one keyframe and then two extra frames. So three frames in total for one pose. So I've got one pose of the flame, another pose, another, and another. I'll fill in the colors. Using the eyedropper here to grab the original color of these, I can then quickly add the color. I'm not being very complex with my flame. I'm not drawing the, uh, you know, in a flame, you've got the blue tip of it and then the golden center of it and then the red and the orange outside and all that complexity. I'm not doing anything with uh, gradients. We haven't really talked about gradients uh, much. So I'm not being too complex, but the point is I'm drawing a flame. And then if I were to play this timeline here, if flame is moving, if I've got the base visible, it's even better. Play the timeline of this one symbol. You can also select loop. Uh, what's really dumb about loop is you have to tell it how much you want to loop. And almost always you want to loop all your drawing. This is not affecting anything except to you for you to see your current animation. But this loop right here, if you turn this on, then you need to change this uh, range to the beginning so that when this plays, it will actually look like it's looping. Again, this is not affecting the actual loop of the final animation. This is just to preview your current animation to see how it's looking like because you have to press play every time, right? You press play once, it animates. I don't get the full effect. I have to press it again. On the keyboard, you can press enter, press enter, press enter. Or you can turn on that loop. But then if you if you leave it by the default, it's just going to loop those two frames, and that's not correct. So what I'm saying about this is dumb is because you have to tell it loop the whole thing that I just animated. It's not, it doesn't know you want that until you tell it. So I like overall how the flame is flaming, but maybe there's a little bit over here happening behind the torch that doesn't quite make sense. So now that I have the base visible, I can find the layer. Where do I have that? So right here, I guess on that very first, on that very first frame, I got the flame a little bit too far in the wrong place. Temporarily remember on a layer, if you double click the layer, symbol you can temporarily turn the turn the visibility of it opacity so that then you can kind of see what you're doing and I see okay that's why the flame looks so far out of the way there so then I can fix that if I want and double click the layer again put it back on full visible bit so here i'm just making the flame itself move around but for really advanced techniques you can do that technique where you've got little sparks flying off and such embers obviously that's not quite right but um to be on the correct layer i'm drawing on the wrong layer here Draw the embers. I'll fix them properly in a moment. But you can do that sparkly embers.
that's terrible. But you get the idea. You can still go in and do some little sparks flying around off of the flame. So undo all of that. Now, better yet, when I'm done working on the animation of this one instance, I'm going to press the back button to go back to my main timeline. I'm going to press play from the main timeline. Test movie, I mean. I just animated all of these flames, and I know it took 10 frames, but I'm not seeing anything. Well, that's the default behavior. If your animation in, in the symbol is 10 frames, but on the main timeline, you don't have 10 frames, it will not play your animation. Right, the torch itself has 10 frames, so you need at least 10 frames in your main timeline. So I'm gonna put this on three seconds, 75, let's say. For 75, I need both of those layers to be visible. You can drag and select both frame 75 of both your layers then press F5. So now from frame one to 75, three seconds, I've got at least 10 frames. My torch needs at least 10 frames. At at least 10 frames, I've got 75 frames. Now when I play, eight torches are torching. So the problem was you've got one frame in the main timeline, but you've got 10 frames in your symbol. So add more, add more time to both layers, of course. If you only add time to your torch, well, okay, your torch is going to animate and then everything disappears because it's on its own layer. Everything needs, of course, time. Frames, F5. Might say, okay, this looks really cool, but they're all flaming exactly the same. That's not quite realistic. Maybe you want that effect. Maybe you want something that is animated exactly the same. Sure, it's done. But probably you want things to animate slightly different for more randomness and realism. We can do that. So lock my background, unlock my torches. Question over here, ladies. So the torches right now are all animating at the exact same way. They all start from the exact same frame one, the animate and loop. We can select a different starting point frame. We've got, we've got 10 to choose from. Well, actually five, five keyframes to choose from. On one, on three, on five, on seven, and on nine. So we have five different starting points where, where our animation could start. They're all starting right now by default on one. I'm going to select, I'm going to keep one starting on frame one. I'm going to select another one, go to the properties. And here we get back to these properties. And here we have some really cool and useful tools here. How are we looping? How are we dealing with this graphic? Do we want it to loop over and over and over? That's the default. Do you want it to just play one time? Do you want it to, to only show a certain frame and stop there? Do you want this to loop backwards? from the final frame to the first frame? Do you want it to loop to play back from the final and come back to the beginning only once? Okay, I want loop and I want to pick frame picker. 
want to pick, starting maybe from, I don't know, uh, three, let's say. So that one is going to start from the third keyframe, the, the third frame. This one on the top over here, I'm going to pick that one to start from something else. Seven. This one over here, I'm going to pick it to start on something else. These are starting on a different frame. All of these, because they are a symbol, you have various things you can edit, like their starting point, how much they loop, etc. Now, when I test this, they are slightly different, each of them. The more frames that I have, the more animation that I have, the more variety of frames I can pick, and therefore the more sort of like randomness. I've only got 10 frames of animation in total, so a limited number of frames to pick, technically five keyframes, five different changes. So it might not be as random as I would like. This is a very powerful thing. When we get to the video game portion of things, this will be very useful to create an environment. Is that a general question or help? No. Okay, uh, if it's help, then we got Alex coming. So here we've got all of these various symbols animating on their own timeline in their own world, graphic is showing its own particular starting point of, um, of, a, of the symbol. It's kind of cool also if you do the play graphic in reverse, depending how you animate it. But let's say I'm going to pick the one on the left over here. Instead of starting on three, here's another place. You can visually see which one you want to pick. But you can also um, you can also type a number there. I know I wanted to start at a certain number. I usually do the frame picker because I don't I, I don't remember what all my frames look like. So the frame picker is amazing. This is a relatively recent addition to animate. I've been teaching animate for like ten years, and they keep making it better and better and better. And this is kind of a new thing, so you don't know what you're missing or you don't know how good you have it. But in the old days, you had to really try, okay, I'm gonna type seven, that's the wrong one. Okay, is it eight, uh, is it nine? But with the frame picker, that's amazing. And what's amazing is that they added these cool little loops here recently. So if you do a reverse, it'll start on 10 and it'll loop backwards. And on this case, it doesn't matter that my flame is backwards, but on some things it definitely will matter. If you've got a character walking, walking forward, and then you select to loop it backwards, it's gonna look like it's walking backwards, which you may want or not. But in my case here, I've set loop the flame backwards just for more randomness. Depending how you drew your animation, you may see like a little skip. You see on mine, there's a moment when there's sort of like a little, little it's very subtle, but there's like a little skip. That has to do with how you drew your animation. The best looping animations are very handcrafted in that when you when you draw them, the uh, ending point is very similar to your starting point. If I go back to the library and edit the torch. What I mean by that, there's my starting point. There's my ending point. That looks very different. So when we do the loop, it'll loop back to the starting point and it might it might seem like a very big change. So either that ending graphic, I will draw it a little bit closer to what the starting graphic looks like, or I will add another frame so that it looks a little bit closer to the starting point so that when it loops, it doesn't look like such a big jump. Now each of these is there and each of these has been edited a little bit within the looping capabilities. What's the result so far? On a scale of one to 10, tell me how amazing this looks like in the chat. One, not that amazing. 10, super amazing. The capability of creating symbols 
and then instances of symbols and that the symbols can be different copies and edited and starting on different frames so that it saves you time. Let's say for even more variety, well, if every one of these torches is exactly the same, that's okay. But if I make one symbol, let's do this. In the library, I have that one symbol I made. If you right click, we have a bunch of options here. Uh, one of them is duplicate. Start with a certain drawing, with a certain symbol, duplicate it, and it'll inherit all of my original lines and animations and frames, and then I can make more changes. Let's do this. I've got all these four perfect copies. Maybe I want one slightly different, because that one's going to be in the video game. That's the one that I pull on. Right, that's the classic video game trope that something looks slightly different. I probably have to interact with it. So if one of those torches is slightly different or the video game portion of things later, that's a pro tip. So let's right click, let's duplicate. What name would we give it? Uh, let's say torch V2 or torch secret or to torch alt or whatever. So I've got torch, torch two. And if I double click to edit that, I'm not gonna spend too, too much time on this, but the point is I've got a copy of my original drawing and what I can do there is make some changes. Like the only thing I'm gonna make is a change to the actual base. Uh, I'm gonna leave the flame alone, but on the base itself, maybe I'm just gonna redraw the base. So let's see, I'm going to delete the base and just redraw another kind of a base. It's on its own layer. So then all of this is a lot easier to do because of the power of layer uh, of layers. Shows that my graphic of the flame is a little bit weird, but that's part of the process of of refining my drawings. And so colors. So on this particular one, I might have to just take more effort to refine that, but it's kind of interesting. So I've got a completely different base. If I go back to the to my to my scene over here. I want one of those to be different. I've made a copy of my torch. I've made that torch different. Notice also we can see a little play button here if you want to preview. What does that symbol look like? particular instance. Okay, well, I can delete that one and then drop the other one in, but Animate has a way to replace symbols. It might be easier to replace a symbol rather than delete a symbol and put a new one. So that one, I'm going to replace it. If I select it, go to my properties of this object. Um, this is an instance of the graphics torch. Instead, I want to replace or switch it. This icon here means to switch it. This instance of this torch, 
graphics torch. I want to swap it with my other torch. So now that's an instance of torch two. Torch that looks different than the rest. Maybe that one unlocks the secret passageway. So we spent this amount of time talking about symbols. Let's move on to the next topic, but let's pause here. General questions or comments? How this works either here in class or on the chat. Does this kind of make a little bit of sense? We've got a timeline, a symbol. It's its own little world. You can put copies of that into the main timeline. Make duplicates of these symbols. You can replace or swap a copy from the stage onto something else. It's a very powerful concept that we're going to do a lot of. So. No questions. Okay. Next topic then is scenes. We saw here that when we edit a symbol, you're in the world of the symbol. You press back. It takes you to scene one. You edit the, the symbol in place, right? It fades everything else, fades everything out. You see the timeline of this symbol. You're in the timeline, in the world of that symbol. You can go back to scene one. You can go back main timeline. Okay, well, scenes, if we've got a scene one, is there a scene two? Yes, all the way up to scene infinity and a half. You can make as many scenes as you want. And a scene, think about it as a sort of, let's say you're writing an essay or a story and there's a paragraph. This paragraph has a thought. Traditionally, paragraphs are used because you've got a thought to talk about. This paragraph has this plot in your story, the introduction. Next paragraph, that is the part of the plot about the adventure. Third paragraph, that's the part of the plot about the conclusion. Three paragraphs, three sections of the story. Scenes, you can kind of think about that as paragraphs or parts of the plot. And that's another thing to recommend. You could put all your, your whole idea of a movie on one timeline, scene one. But it is very useful to divide up the various plot points into a scene. The introduction to my movie where the credits take place, scene one. The next scene where we fade into the castle, scene two. The next scene where we're inside of the castle where we meet the queen, scene three, etc. So I would recommend each, each animation idea, each part of the plot, to be in its own scene. That by, let's go to the window menu. We've got scene. There's a scene panel, which has a shortcut, Shift F2. Let's go this way, window, scene, panel. This gives us a little panel here. Scene one. And rename your scenes. Double click castle. All the stuff about the castle happens in this scene. Or maybe this is intro. The introduction of, of, of the world is in this scene. I'll castle for the moment. It's a shortcut on MacBook. Um, on the Mac, um, probably come. What is it on the Mac? Um, I would assume it's still F2, but probably F2 will open up your CD drive or whatever. So you might have to press Control, Shift, F2. Oftentimes the F keys are connected to the brightness or the volume or whatever. Uh, so you probably have to press a different button and then the F key. It's probably Control, Shift, F2, something like that. Scene is uh, scene one. I renamed it to Castle. And this panel is very simple. Create a scene, 
duplicate a scene, delete a scene. Okay, create a new scene. Scene two, I'll call that um, text intro. I want, you know how the Star Wars movies start off. There's first the text, then the action starts. So maybe I want something to happen first, text, and then I want the castle. Well, just like layers, the order of these scenes matter, and it's from top to bottom. So up, my castle scene will happen first. Then my text scene will happen. That doesn't make sense. So I want to drag the text intro first. I want text to appear. Then I want the castle to appear. Just to temporarily put something here, uh, you know, let's, I'm just going to write a quick text title here. Idea is that this is the title of my project, which is uh, the adventure. It's the name of my movie. So I have some sort of text that appears first, and then the then the then the movie starts. The project starts. If I press play or test movie, the order of the scenes matter. So it's from top to bottom. One scene will play. When that scene ends, the next scene will play, then the next, and the next automatically. So if I press test, it does exactly what I told it. It shows the name of my movie for one twenty-fourth of a frame, which is like almost subliminal. So I want the text to appear, of course, some amount of time so I can read it. And then the movie starts. Every time you create a scene, Every scene has its own timeline. So on my text scene, I have one frame, one twenty-fourth of a second. It's not enough time to read it. I want to read it for at least one second, so obviously F5. And then that's going to play for one second. So if I press play here, it's going to play for one second, and then the movie will start. This is what I said previously about as a beginner, you all make the mistake about it, assuming that everyone can read your, read your mind. In your mind, the timing of it, all of this is perfect. You know how much this lasts. You read it. You wrote it yourself. You know how much. But when you have someone else look at it, they're going to say, oh, that's too fast. Or I didn't even get to read that. What did that say? So this is definitely where you can get feedback from someone else that is not you, that has not worked on the project, and, and ask them, do you think this looks good? Does this text last enough? Et cetera. If you don't have someone to ask, when there's text, one thing that you can do is read it out loud yourself. Not in your mind, because we can read at the speed of light. Read it out loud. And if you can read it comfortably two or three times, it's enough time. So let's say my project is going to start here. I read it. The Big Adventure. Very close. It's kind of like I barely have enough time to read it out loud. So I need more time. Maybe I'll make this last two seconds, three seconds, whatever. The longer the name of the longer the text is, the more time necessary to read it. This is definitely when you want to use the technique. Read it out loud. You know, read it at a normal pace out loud. Don't try to read it fast. The Big Adventure. You know, read it out loud like a normal speed. If you can read it out loud at a normal speed, it's long enough. In my case, let's say two seconds. Enter. Okay, and then it starts. You see the default behavior. We start on frame one, scene one. It plays all the frames. When it runs out of frame, it then goes to frame one, scene two. When those run out, it goes to frame one, scene three, to scene 10,000. It goes from the order from top to bottom, left to right in the timeline. When it ends there, it goes to the next. Later on, when we do the video game stuff on CIS 126, 
we will be able to jump between different scenes. We will have a scene where choose your character and then choose your path. And they go through the dark woods instead of the city. And then they click to enter a house. So every concept of the story, like in the game, should be its own scene. It could all be on one timeline, but then it just gets harder to manage. If you know that things will play in order, right after the other, that's, uh, that's how you can get around in your project. And the default is also that when it gets to the final frame, it loops back to scene one frame one. I wish it would stop at that point. Well, of course there's a way. We'll learn that later. But of course, there's a way to stop your playback. Of course, there's a way to press, to, to, to set up that your movie pauses and plays and rewinds and such. Of course, there's a way to do interactivity. That's later. But the default is that it plays from beginning to end. Question over here. So the, uh, do you still have a question there, Andy? So at this point, we've been talking about symbols. A symbol to be duplicated multiple times. Um, we start to talk about scenes. They're a very powerful concept. It's straightforward how to use them. Started to see that. Uh, I don't have it as a, as, a as a separate thing about special effects, but we're going to do that right now. And then we'll wrap up with camera. Special effects. We started to look a little bit about that when we have a symbol. If I go back to the castle, if I select the symbol of the torch, the properties, the special effects are found within here. Color effects. something is a symbol, it unlocks various other special effects. Let's do this for a moment. If we go back to the torch, select it, properties, color effects. We have none, brightness, tint, advanced, alpha. Brightness, its purpose is to make something brighter or darker. That's easy. Set it to a, an exact value. This one's interesting. You have, first of all, you you sort of have the uh, sort of like the strength of it on the first slider, and then the nuances of the particular color channels. So this is basically to colorize something. You can also directly go up, pick a different color. I want this to be the green torch. It's not going to be completely maybe how you think, okay, you know how you have the palette swaps in video games, especially like in fighting games. All right, okay, th this version of Chun-Li has the regular colors and this one's got the red colors. Well, this is how you do an easy color swap in a game, for example. You can tint it to the various other color palettes. Uh, advanced, uh, don't worry about this one for the moment. And then alpha. This one is transparency. Here's how you can make things different transparencies. Let's say I draw a waterfall. I animate a waterfall symbol, but I want to be able to see a little bit behind it because it's a secret passageway behind that waterfall. If I change that alpha to some amount, 90%, I can see through the depending what it's in front of, of course. But I can see through that behind. Let's say I'm dealing with, you know, ghost characters. Here's a way to make transparency for your ghost characters. It's a symbol. You have these special effects. And then with the special effect, for example, transparency. So in my case, I don't want any of those. I'm just showing you, you've got these special effects. None of these make sense for the current uh, symbol. But 
with special effects, we can do the thing that people love, fading in or fading out of a scene. You have to think two steps ahead. You have to think outside the box. But via special effects, we can do a fade in. Right now, our project just starts, the big adventure. I would want it first. It's all dark. Maybe music is playing. Then we get a fade in to see the text. And then the rest of the movie starts. You can have the text itself fade in. That's a way we could do it. We can do it as a, how I'm saying. Everything's dark. And then we fade in to see the text. I want to do that. If can access alpha, which is fade. If you can access alpha, when there's a symbol, okay, we need to draw a symbol of a black screen, and then the black screen will be completely visible, alpha 100, and then it'll fade into alpha zero, so that it fades away the black, and then we can see the text. So symbol combining with effect. So back onto my text layer uh, scene. I've got a layer that's not going to change the text. I lock it in your in your text scene. I'm locking my text layer. It's not going to change. I'm going to make a new layer. Call it fade in. So the idea will be that everything's going to be black, and then it's going to fade into visible. So I'm going to draw with the rectangle tool a black square covering the whole, the whole stage. I would recommend to definitely go outside here. If people are trying to go to the exact left corner and make the square, you're going to miss a piece right there. It's going to look bad. It's going to look amateurish. I would recommend definitely start outside of your timeline, uh, of your stage, and then go to definitely outside of it. Don't try to get the exact corner of it. And yes, even though when we turn this into a symbol, the uh, we can set exact coordinates. Don't bother about it being an exact coordinate or something like this, just make it big and it covers everything. There's a black square, frame one of, of this layer. I want to be able to do the alpha transparency. Alpha transparency happens when you have a symbol so let's turn this black shape into a symbol. This black shape that I drew, select it, right click, convert to symbol or F8. Give it a name, GFX, it's a graphic. And um, call it maybe just black square, a rectangle, but black square type of graphic, registration in the center. Converting this black square into a symbol so I can apply special effects. I want a bit of pause in the darkness, and then a fade into the text. So this first second will be will remain black. And then from the first second to wherever will fade. So on frame um, 24, F6, which is the same as uh, insert keyframe.
So F5 adds more time, no change. F6 copies the previous keyframe so I can use it as a basis to change it. F7, blank keyframe so I can draw a brand new keyframe. F6 here so I can copy the previous frame which is which has the black square and then from frame one or second one to second two is where that is where the change will happen. I'm going to go to second two, F6 there, that copies the previous keyframe so I can make a change. And the change will be that I go from fully visible black to fully invisible black. I'm going to fade from a fully black screen to a zero black screen. So on the first second over here, select that. Tell it that the color effect will be alpha, completely visible. On the next keyframe, going to select that and say that that alpha is completely invisible. So fully visible, fully invisible, and in between, any frame in between, right click, create a classic tween. Here's where it'll do the automation for us. Here's what it will for us do the frame by frame of fully visible, little by little by little by little bit less visible to completely invisible. Instead of me animating frame by frame fading in, I'm doing the automation that we learned two weeks ago of a classic tween, but now coupling it with symbols and special effects. So then when I create classic tween, I see here, if I play it at the beginning, a pause for a moment, then a fade in, text is visible. Yeah, let me go back and do that one more time. The main thing is you need to make sure you've got your frames set up right. So, frame 24, F6, that copies the previous black shape. Frame 48, F6, copied it. So three frames, three keyframes, black shape, black shape, black shape. Second keyframe, select it. Color effect set to alpha, 100. Third keyframe, select it. Color effect to alpha, zero. Anywhere in between those keyframes, right click, create classic tweet. This of course all works because I first drew the black shape, converted to a symbol. Then when it's a symbol, then I can do all of this, specifically the color alpha. Press play. I see the fade. Better yet, if I press test movie, I can get the full effect. It's dark for a moment, then we fade in, uh, and then we go back to the scene, but obviously didn't have enough time to read it. And to read it, we can fix that, of course, easily. But we've got darkness for a moment, then a fade of one second, then the text, which we need to display more, then we go to the next scene. We're not seeing the fully visible text long enough, obviously, right? Because we're seeing blackness for one second. Then we have a change of blackness to invisibility. Fade in for one second. Then we've only got three frames. We've got three frames here, only three frames, where we actually see the text visibly completely. Three twenty-fourths is not enough time to read this. So I'm going to... So maybe to frame 75 and add F5 to the text. See if that's long enough. Darkness, fade in, enough time to read it or not. Maybe still not enough time. Just add more time, more F5 to the text. So notice my timeline here. I have a keyframe with a pose, a drawing, no change until here. 
What's going to change from here to here is the fade. I tween it so that it does it for me. The text layer, frame one, one pose, one drawing. The text, which doesn't change, does not change. I F5 all the way to the end here. I don't need to display my fade in. It ends on frame 50. I, I don't always need all of these layers to match up. I could, it doesn't matter at all in this case because that layer served its purpose. It did a fade in, invisible. Invisible is no visibility. Therefore, I don't need that layer to be visible anymore until the end. If I extend it, it's the same thing. It extends it not being visible. End result is the same. After it fades in, or after it fades away, the text is visible for some amount of time. A bit more, frame 100. How do I know how long? Again, if you can read it out loud at a reasonable pace, it's long enough. And the technique of adding nothing is a hard technique to teach because in your mind, you read it, you wrote it, you know what it says. But when someone else looks at your movie for the first time, they're experiencing it for the first time and not adding enough time of pause is often a big beginner mistake that you get better at as you, as you do it, as you experience it, as you feel it. I guess there's technically a, I guess there's technically like a, make sure you always do 48 frames. I guess there's a rule, but it really is much more, how does it feel? Does it feel like there's enough time or not? And that's the right answer. So the project is this way. Take one more break, a little bit of shorter one until two again. But here's what we have so far, looking at scenes and using a special effect of fading out a black square. So visually what people will see, oh, we got a cool fade in. What we have behind the scenes, a black square that is fully visible that then tweens into fully invisible. It's a special effect for many purposes as we go later on. Let's take one more break until two. And then at uh, two, we'll look at the last thing for the day, which is the camera. Because let's say in my amazing adventure here, the next thing that I want to happen is that after the, um, after we establish everything, now we want the camera to kind of move around, I guess, and point at something or pay attention to something, I guess. So let's take a break until two, and then we'll do the next part. Uh,
All right, everyone. So for the final uh, animation technique for today, let's look at the camera feature of Adobe Animate. Now, Animate is not a 3D drawing program like Blender and the like. Something like Blender creates a world or an environment mathematically calculated so that if you create the floor and then a tower in the middle of the floor, it creates a world that is in you know, digital three dimensions. So when you have a camera pointed at that tower, you can animate the camera in Blender so that it goes behind the tower. Animate is not a 3D rendering type of software. So it doesn't have the capability like Blender to move a camera around in an environment like Blender. It's often referred to as a two and a half D not a 3D or a 2D, but a 2.5D type of software that you have flat drawings on a timeline, but you still have the ability to move around in the project, but not really go behind a thing unless you animate the, the behind of it. So the camera of this software can often be very useful in terms of like, let's say you are zooming into a part of the animation or you're moving off to the side and that sort of thing. So kind of like if I'm if I'm standing looking at the scene over there, my camera's right here, and I'm kind of like looking around that way. That's kind of the camera. Not exactly like that. I walk behind the thing, like 3D software, like Blender. There's that limitation. Let's see what we can do with it. We're gonna make a new scene. You got your text scene, your castle scene. Let's make a new scene. Actually, let's duplicate this scene. Um, what do we want to do here? Um, yeah, let's let's do a duplicate instead. So if you if you create a new, uh, delete that. Instead, we're going to do a duplicate. Uh, we're going to take our existing scene and duplicate it. Now, the camera stuff I'm about to show you, we could apply it to this one castle here, this scene here. But again, it's often a good idea to separate a concept or an animation or a plot point into its own scene. So I want to have a plot point where the text is the, the, the text of my movie is visible for a moment. And then I want a plot point where the establishing shot of the castle is visible for some amount of time. And then I want a plot point or an animation where then I move the camera around. Like let's say we're trying to find where is, you know, which window, which window within the castle is where the, the evil wizard is at. And I want to move the camera around to, to find them. So let's duplicate the castle and uh, a name. Let's call this castle camera. Or anything else just to keep track that it's different. Castle 2, whatever. And so now we have an exact copy of everything that was in that scene. That could be very useful that I have built up a scene and then I can duplicate it to do different things to it. The different thing that I want to do here is now I want to animate the camera. Careful here, both of these are exactly the same. And the thing that's going to be different is the castle camera, I will animate the camera. And the regular castle, I will not animate the camera. To animate the camera, we can do it in several ways. Maybe the most direct way is right here within your layers. We have an icon right there that looks like a classic camera. So within your new scene, click the camera icon, add camera. That creates a new layer, a new keyframe, and some new symbols on screen here. If I click onto another layer, I'm on a separate layer. And if I click on the camera layer, I'm on the camera layer. Got a different icon here as well. This is the camera. It's funny that this icon is not exactly the same as that icon or that icon, but all of these are camera. And so when you click on this, you've got a camera layer. You can turn on or off the camera. Turn on the camera and you select the layer. Properties, if you go to tool, 
when I create a camera, you can only have one camera layer. It's not so advanced that you can have multiple cameras moving all over the place. You can do that technique in different scenes, but one scene has one camera. It's camera tool property where you have these camera settings, X and Y, zoom and rotate. So again, it's not full 3D, but we can go behind the castle. If we made this castle in Blender, we rendered that it was made out of these bricks and that it had this depth and so forth. And in Blender, we can go behind the object because it exists. This doesn't exist unless what we've drawn. We can move the camera X coordinates, left and right. We can move it Y coordinates, up and down, or reset to go back to normal. We can zoom in, get close to the drawing. We can zoom out, back out of the drawing or reset, and then we can rotate. And again, this is not rotating around the object, this is rotating around the, the world. Like if I have this and I rotate the camera, I'm gonna rotate this. Not that I'm gonna go from here to here, it's gonna rotate this. So these coordinates here can also be changed via the, this panel here. We have this one representing zoom, we have this one representing rotation. Zoom, if you drag this to the right, I'm going to zoom in. And the great thing about drawing with animate is that your lines will always be crisp because they're mathematically calculated and they'll always be perfectly crisp. Now, the weird thing about this slider is that it is relative. I dr dragged it all the way to the right, and when I let it go, it snapped back to the center. And I drag it again to the right, I zoom in more, zoom in more, zoom in more. I drag to the left, it zooms out and out, 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 and even further out like that. Well, I've zoomed out so far, I've gotten to the edge of my world. I've gone to the edge of my drawing. This is what's gonna appear in the scene at this point. If I only view this scene, we haven't seen this yet, control, test scene, when we hit this test movie, it plays everything from start to finish, all scenes. If I only want to focus on the animation of this scene from the control menu, test this scene. So this particular scene, I'm zoomed out. Well, I'm seeing the edge of the world. I'm seeing the edge of the drawing. That doesn't look right. Where's the rest of the world? Just what I'm saying is be aware that this camera is going to do literally what you tell it. And I zoomed out so far, I'm seeing nothing. I'm seeing like a floating rock in space, I guess. In the original, in the original way that I drew this, well, I drew enough of it that went outside of the frame because I was not seeing it. But once I start to zoom out, I'm going to see there's nothing there. It's just telling me in my case that I went to 72. Instead of 100%, I zoomed out to 75%. I can put that back to 100, or I can just reset. If instead of using these sliders here, I actually click on the scene, I'm going to move around. But the weird thing here is that it's going to move in the flipped Y axis. If you've played video games and you're playing with a controller and you know that if you press down, you move up your ship or you move up the camera, if on the controller you press down, you're moving forward, right? That sort of movement uh, on a video game. This is happening similar. If I drag my mouse down, the scene moves up. If I drag up, the scene moves down. Again, imagine it's a camera uh, pointing at a scene. And as I move the camera down, I'm moving the camera down, the scene moves up out of the way. If I move the camera up, the scene moves down out of the way. So it is backwards there. I always forget it too, and I have to do it the wrong way, then I do it the right way. But it's going to be backwards. I think there's a setting somewhere in the settings maybe that you can reverse those. But the default is up is down. And that's telling you you moved it X and Y. You can reset those back to zero. If I move to the left, if I if I click and drag to the left, it moves to the right. If I click and drag to the right, it moves to the left. Again, it's backwards. But if I move the camera to the left, the scene is moving to the right. 
And if I move the camera to the right, it's moving the scene to the left. It's backwards and you'll get used to it. It's that. If I switch over to the other icon here, okay, so if I click to the right, to the rotate again, if I click, oh, if you, um, if, if you click instead the rotate icon and then slide the icon there, okay, you're gonna rotate the camera. It's relative. If I rotate it all the way over here and let it go, it snaps back into place. That was a negative 30 rotation, which I can then reset. So the camera can be used in many ways. You make a drawing, and then you reposition the camera on a different scene. That's it. Or you can use the camera in animation. With a classic tween, I can tween the cameras looking here, and then the camera's looking here in between, classic tween. Camera's looking here, zoom in here, in between those keyframes, classic tween. So the point is, on the camera layer, if I make keyframes, and then there's a difference between the keyframe, I can right click classic tween and it will animate for me the camera moving this way smoothly and this way smoothly. So let's try that. Let's say we're gonna pause for one second. So on frame 24, F6 copies the previous keyframe of the camera between frame one, uh, between the first second and the second second, I wanna zoom in. So frame 48, F6 to zoom in frame 24, I'm zoomed out this far. Frame 48, I'm zoomed in this far. In between, right click, classic tween. It animates for me, zooming in. Control test scene, so you can focus on the animation only of this scene without having to start over a pause at the beginning, one second, then a zoom in. Again, keyframes, this time keyframes of a camera, not, not an actual object on screen to select, but a whole camera itself. And the camera itself has keyframes. So zoomed in some amount, maybe I want to further pause here a moment to get my bearings. Where do I look at? What do I do? Pause here for a moment. So no change for one second. This is frame 72, F6. Zoom into this point right here. No change for one second. Now moving forward from here to the next second, a change. So let's see, moving forward over here to the fourth second, which is frame 96, F6. Background and everything disappears, of course, because it doesn't exist, so F5 to the rest, to the rest. One second in the beginning, no change. One second of a zoom in. One second of no change, a pause. Now, from frame, frame 72 to 96, I'm gonna now maybe move over to this tower over here that other tower somewhere in the center, and at the same time, zoom in a little bit. So you can do the movement and the camera rotate and the zoom in at every keyframe. So at this keyframe, it, it's, it's at that zoom level. At this next keyframe, it's zoomed in a little bit more and moved over. Two keyframes here, so in between, right click, classic tween. It will anim it'll do the calculations for me to do the zoom in and move over. Control test scene to get the full picture. So it does what it what it needs to do, but then suddenly it starts over because I didn't add time at the end. I'm gonna get used to that. But it's doing what I want. Little pause, little zoom in, little pause, move over, pause again. Okay, pause again, pause for one more second. I'm just keeping it simple by just keeping, keep selecting one complete second 
obviously more frames, more time, slower, less frames, less time, faster. I'm making all of this take one second at a time. I want things faster, make it ha happen in half a second, even faster, a quarter of a second. One second is 24, half a second is 12, a quarter of a second is six, six, 12, 24. 24 regular speed or slow-ish, 12 speed faster, or six, 12 frames faster, six frames even faster. Just keeping it simple, one second at a time. One second of pause here so that we can focus. Okay, we're looking at that tower. So F6 on the camera, because there's going to be a change in a moment. F5 on the other ones, no change. And move over. Pause for one second. Zoom in further into the... I'm going to zoom in further into the window of that tower. Fifth second to sixth second, F6. Make the background keep visible, F5, F5. The difference here now, more zoom. Zoom. Maybe also slightly change the position a little. Frame here, keyframe here, in between. Right-click, classic tween. I tell you already, I'm gonna to forget to I'm gonna to forget to add pause at the end. You're gonna to forget to add pause at the end. It it stops right here. So we think, yeah, that's what I want, but it won't do it on you won't do what, what you want unless you do it. So pause at the end of here one second. Control menu test this scene. Do we zoom into that one tower for a moment? A little bit of pause, then suddenly you'll see the wizard. Now I'm not gonna animate them moving into the screen and their hat moving in anything. I'm just gonna, suddenly a wizard appears after we look at the window for a moment. So, um, wizard appearing. Um, I'm gonna make a new layer called wizard. After one second of pause here, length keyframe F7 on my wizard layer. Draw a wizard. No, not without any real animation and such, but just a wizard. And then so the point is, paused here for a moment, what are we looking at? Then wizard appears. Obviously, I want to animate it looking up and smiles and whatever. But here is the story taking shape. Pause at the end, of course. Notice this, what happens? This is very interesting. Where, whereas when a layer is not visible, so... It, when a layer is not visible right here, the, it will disappear. But when a camera layer is not visible, it just resets back to no changes. So in this case, I don't want that. I'm zoomed in here. Why do I suddenly zoom out like that? Maybe I want that. But the, what I'm getting at is that when you have no visibility of a camera, it resets back to no camera movements. All of the movements and positions of camera exist in the camera layer. So this is just that you need F5 or else the camera resets back to zero. And if I test this particular um, scene, test this scene, ladies, a little help over here. So now it's coming here. I zoom in, pause for a moment, wizard appears. Need more of a pause. Seeing the wizard for this amount of time is not enough. I don't, don't register it enough at this point. So more time, more F5.
So in total, this portion of my whole grand movie is taking, in my case, just about nine seconds. My scene of text, this is taking about four seconds. The ability here of just setting the scene of the castle takes three seconds. We have four plus three plus nine. That's 12, uh, six, 16, four, five, six, seven, yeah, 16. It's taking 16 seconds in total. I've made 16, I've made a 16 second long movie so far. Not a lot really has happened technically, but even just setting up the title of the movie and establishing shot and camera moving around a little bit, 16 seconds so far. I said way back at the start of the semester, one big culmination of this class, part one, is you're going to make a 30-second movie. Almost halfway through a 30-second movie, and I haven't even done anything yet. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just pointing it out. When you first heard, I'm going to have to animate a movie in this class? Yes, and the minimum is 30 seconds. And look how far I've started to go with just setting things up and camera movement and showing text. Then when you have your character frame by frame jumping and whatever, and then when you have... Um, you know, um, and tweens doing whatever, you're going to get to the point, of course, of at least that amount of time. If I test my whole movie now, I want to see its totality. We've got the fade in, the text. We've got an establishing shot, torch is burning seamlessly. We go to the next scene where we now start to zoom in, look around. There's something important there. Let's look around there. There's the wizard. The next scene, maybe I'm inside the castle. I don't know. It's all of these various concepts. Question. How do we uh, make a new layer and then just draw a new wizard at the end of the animation? At the end here, in a brand new layer, like I've got right here, I made a brand new layer and then I, oops, I made a brand new layer. And then after all of that animation happened on the brand new layer, blank keyframe. So you see there's nothing happening on the wizard layer until, in my case, frame 168. But on a brand new wizard layer, after all the camera movement, blank keyframe, and I just drew a little wizard guy. Brand new layer, draw, draw another wizard. It's got its power moves. Venture. Establishing shot. Music playing when we learn about music. Fire crackling. Zooming in. Zoom in here. Wizard appears. Then the music changes ominously. So imagine when we add music and sound to all of this and voice and such. Right away, we spent the first half of the semester so long on just getting used to the software, the drawing tools, coloring, painting, first half of the semester. Second half after spring break, in a very quick amount of time, we started to learn animation. Shortcuts with automated animation, classic tweens, motion tweens. The long way, frame by frame animation last week, this week, frame by frame plus symbols, plus scenes, special effects. We're getting all of these ingredients to make a project, to make a full movie. Obviously, I want to learn to be able to animate the wizard coming out of the tower and the robes flapping and twinkling sounds and all of that stuff. And of course, with time, you can do it all. It's about learning the basic techniques, the basic ingredients, and then putting them together. At this point, this is the project today's work so far, which I think is plenty at this point, plenty for you to start to think about and practice. There's no homework this week, but all of this that I introduced you today, I think you should really experiment with all of this and see how you can take these ingredients and start to play with them. 
Um, the funny thing is making the deadline of last week be tomorrow. Now that you learn this stuff, you might think, oh, I want to start to apply what I did previously. I, I kind of don't recommend to apply what we learned this week to the assignment from last week. I would rather you just focus on the frame by frame. Turn that in tomorrow. If you then want, you can start to add some of the techniques we learned this week to that animation. Maybe I'll take it as an extra credit or something. Maybe I'll do an announcement later today that after you turn in the, the frame by frame assignment from last week, after you turn it in tomorrow, if you want to then do something with what we learned today and add to it, I guess I can take it as extra credit. I'll send a full announcement for that later. But you might be, you might want to add some of these techniques, especially the scenes. I think scenes are very powerful in terms of creating sections of an animation. The assignment from last week was make a character jump. Well, what about if you have a pre-scene about some text? Then you have the scene of the character jumping. And then the next scene of to be continued, applying what we're learning. What about what we learned today? Creating symbols that animate on their own. What if on your character jumping animation, you have twinkling lights, uh, twinkling uh, stars in the background? Again, for extra credit, I'll announce that later if you want to add the week 12 stuff to the week 11 homework. But week 11 is not required to add any of what we learned today. And based on earlier that only four people have turned it in, you have plenty to work on. Question. What's that? Right. On the wizard layer, you create a blank keyframe where you want the, the wizard to appear. At the moment in time, in my case, it was frame 168. You might have different frames, but in my case, after I did that final zoom in, I did a little bit of a pause for a moment, created a brand new layer, and then F7 so that when I want them to appear, then they appear. No extra animation, just appears. I'm not animating them jumping out and their hands moving. I could, of course, but I just want them to appear. But it kind of gets the point. I'm not filling in colors yet, so I can kind of see through the through the robes. So obviously a lot to still fix, but at the very least I made this character appear. So we'll end the lecture at this point. We will do lab time if you want to stay and practice or ask questions. And then um, we'll have Further open lab time at from three to five, so you can work on your assignment if you haven't finished it. And then tomorrow lab time as, as well, 11 to five, and also lab at the library. Week 11 is due tomorrow. Week 12, no homework, but you should practice these things.